So of course, uh, work we did at uh, my lab, the iSpace lab, and at Simon Fraser University, uh, close to Vancouver. And one of the big underlying questions is really, how do we enable natural and embodied spatial orientation, cognition, behavior in virtual environments without having to go through all the effort of letting you move through the environment because there's always a border, there's a stair. Um, so this relates to one of the uh, big challenges I guess we have in virtual reality as well as in using virtual reality in doing research, and that's basically that our spatial perception, cognition, and behavior in virtual reality is not necessarily the same as it is in the real world, especially if users don't physically move. So for example, people get lost a lot more easily, and we observe strange qualitative errors. So they're, they're not just a little bit off, they're systematically and consistently off by a huge amount, and I'll show more of this later. But you can imagine this is a bit of an issue if you spend more than half of your grant money, for example, on this wonderful new virtual reality setup, but it's just not <coughs> very sense that you cannot rely on it being really reproducible and really giving you the same results that you would have in real world motion. It's also a challenge for using the virtual reality and spatial cognition research. Is our research methods really valid? So instead of talking much about this and citing lots of papers that you guys have co-authors, let's try and do this ourselves. So this is an interactive demonstration, so if you can stay with me for one uh, moment. Uh, if the video works, you'll, I'll ask you to point back at the end of this locomotion, as if you would be physically moving. So there's a translation, a rotation, another translation, and in a moment I'll ask you to point back to where you started. So let's try this out. And please leave your hands out there and look around where people are pointing. Okay, thanks for replicating the literature. So, so even though we are all psychonomicists, uh, we can't quite agree on whether we should point to the left or to the right, even though we would all agree that this was a right turn. So what's really going on? Um, so here's a sketch that's trying to explain the two strategies that we observe. So one is what we would call the typical turn strategy for this kind of leftward motion, you point to the left. However, uh, we, about half of the people, sometimes more, sometimes less, point to the opposite direction. So it's kind of like left, right, reverse. And it doesn't really seem to make much sense. And the question is really what is going on there. And what we think is probably going on is the following. So here's again a top-down <coughs> view. These non turners act as if they would not have rotated. So if I do this, it's kind of like sidestepping. And in that manner, it makes sense that they point like this. Here's a little PowerPoint illustration of that. But it's obviously wrong in the sense that this is really not what we ask them to do. This is also not what you would observe under real world motion conditions. So where, when you physically look at you have spatial updating, even with eyes closed, I can walk around and do all kinds of things. And I know my computer's here, my audience is here, even under a somewhat high point of flow. So, what's happening here? So, in order to categorize this, we can uh, simply say, well, people, if they point to the left side, so uh, at least categorically correct, we call them turners and non-turners if they point to the other side. And this, what we observe for these kind of optic flow stimulus, stimuli actually mirrors what you observe for imagined self-motion, that up to 100% of people actually fail to mentally incorporate turns that are not physically performed. For optic flow, it varies between maybe 40 and up to 100% of people fail to update those. In reality, when you physically look them out, basically nobody makes a mistake. Everybody does it automatically, accurately, probably because we have spatial updating working on a somewhat automatized manner. So what's the solution? Well, one possibility would be to simply rotate the observer. And this is exactly why we built our rotational simulator where we can do this uh, computer controlled in a virtual reality environment. So we can produce the actual rotations and compare this to just visual simulation. And there's obviously a lot more fancy setups out there. Um, and of them have come that they try and move the observer <coughs> or let them walk themselves. But clearly this is not for everybody's budget and you know they don't have enough space and all of this. So is there a way we can reduce the effort and still allow for natural embodied spatial orientation? Well, maybe we just need to go beyond the simple optic flow displays that we always use. Some people might argue they are not very naturalistic, ecologically valid, unless you're a cosmonaut. <laughs> so 
But then at the same time, there's all these papers arguing these wonderful things you can do with optic flow, it's a foundation of vision, you can use it for walking, self motion perception, head detection, distance estimation, navigation, homing, illusory self motion. But I would argue it's really not sufficient to really do the most basic of all things, allow you to remain oriented. So instead of using optic flow, how about just using a natural environment? And indeed, in a set where you just do pure rotation, we could show that if you know the scene has lots of landmarks and we just showed no physical locomotion involved, it clearly does enable automatic and obligatory spatial updating for rotations. But the question is, does it translate to, well, translations and curvilinear paths, like the ones that I showed you. So here's a couple of the research questions we have. Of their orientation while they're moving. And how much of these visual cues do we really need? Do we need fully realistic, naturalistic cues that people know? Or would it be sufficient just itself just use them like star fields, actually just give them ground plane, maybe a little indication of where they're going? And how important are really these physical motion cues? Do we really need them? How much of them do we need them? And do they really trigger obligatory spatial updating as the spatial updating uh, literature claims? So to test this, we put people on our rotation simulator. So in half of the trials, participants physically rotated to avoid some visual stimuli. They were wearing headphones to block out all external noises, wide field if you have on display, and a little bonking stick, and they can also use a chalk stick. Um, and here's an illustration of the actual task. So participants sit in there, have a track, they can look around, mostly it just looks straight. There's a little curve in there, and at the end of which they ask you point back. So it looks naturalistic, but there's really no landmarks in this environment. Nothing that indicates directly where it is. And even from the beginning, you cannot see how far the turn goes. So you cannot assess the turning angle. You still have to update, which is critical here. So we use a couple of different angles, uh, just to make sure that we get all kinds of different turning responses. And you compare the complex environment with a simple grass environment. It has a normal ground plane. Um, and a third condition we used was one where we wanted to give people a bit of an indication which direction they will be turning, but without telling them how far. So we had a tiny little white line here that you can probably see, which kind of mimics the dividing line that you have in the middle of the street. Again, you can only kind of see around the curve, but it gives you an indication which direction you, uh, you will be going. So here's a full experiment design. A motion with snow motion, three different <coughs> environments. Uh, five plus, times two different turning angles, and half the participants started in the grass environment, the simple environment, and the other half started in the city environment. Mm -hmm. So, what did you find? Well, if you take a top down look at the data, and these individual ones are the mean direction, pointing direction from participants, it looks a bit messy. So, uh, how can we make sense of this? Mm -hmm. Well, one way is to just basically categorize uh, participants into turners versus non-turners um, because that's independent of whether there's a little bit of uh, back uh, forward back motion. And if you do this, you see some participants are fairly consistently turners, some fairly consistently non-turners, a lot are in between. So we ended up categorizing on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. So coming to our main research questions, one was, well, do the physical motions really make the task easier? Um, and the prediction would be, yes, it should, if it triggers automatic spatial updating. It should reduce <coughs> time load, reduce task difficulty, reduce response times. However, we didn't find any of that. So the physical rotations did not reduce the difficulty ratings, didn't make it easier, didn't make it faster. Well, would they at least somehow reduce the non-turner rate, so the failure to update rotations? And again, uh, according to the literature, it should because physical motions are supposed to trigger automatic spatial updating. Um, so you should have an update for all trials, and this should ultimately eliminate all non turn behavior. Um, again, we didn't find any of that. So physical rotation did not reduce the non turn behavior. We, we really checked everything uh, because we couldn't believe it ourselves. Um, so how about the, using the more naturalistic cues, does this help to reduce uh, the non turn rate and induce automatic spatial updating. And so here the 
difficulty ratings actually go down, so it's perceived as easier to do the task in a more naturalistic environment. And also there's a bit of a reduction in response time, so people can do the task faster in a naturalistic city environment. So yes, they do make the task easier and faster. But, so is this does it mean it's already based on automatic and obligatory update of rotations? If so, <coughs> then the non trivial rate should really go down. So this is the next uh, slide. So in the simple grass environment, you have all, all about 35% of non-Turner trials. So in 35% of the trials, people fail to update the Turner point to the operation. In the city environment, this was down to 10%. And interestingly enough, in the grass environment, even though you just give them this tiny little indication which direction they will be going, it already helps them quite a bit to reduce this non-Turner behavior. So, Yes, the naturalistic stimulus can facilitate updating of rotations, it can reduce non turner rate, and even a simple uh, line on the ground can give some help there. The well, final question we wanted to investigate here is, well, if people start in one environment, let's say the optic flow, the grass environment, will they transfer the strategy to the city environment, so keep the wrong strategy? And what we observe is exactly that. So if people start in the grass environment, um, on the left side, they keep overall a higher non-tuner rate than compared to starting with the city environment. So it seems like there is overall some kind of um, transfer going on, some tendency to keep their strategy. So in summary, I hope to have convinced you that these strange non turn behaviors <coughs> do really exist, they are not an artifact. <coughs> And that providing naturalistic cues actually can help to reduce this uh, non turner behavior, maybe by triggering on my spatial updating. Um, and even a simple line on the ground actually helps. So, just an indication of where they will be going. Note that overall, our rate of non turns is already lower than in the simple star field. So, just having a bit of a more naturalistic ground plane might already help. However, some people still point in the wrong direction. So, they did not obligatorily. Up, uh, basically trigger spatial updating. So people still did not update, like 10% and still made these mistakes. So we're not fully there. Quite surprisingly, so adding physical rotations did not facilitate the updating of rotations, which actually confirms an earlier study, so it's not an artifact or anything, but it's still surprising given the previous results. So we might wonder, well, might it be a problem that we're not just doing rotation, but also translation, so combinations of this? And in a way, it seems unlikely, if you look at Kotsky and other papers, you can do fairly easily update, imagine <coughs> translation, do point to origin tasks from just imagine translation and so on, but it's always only in the rotations where you have problems with. So it seems more like, well, maybe there's not enough visuals, maybe we need more landmarks. Or, I don't know exactly what else is missing. But I hope I have convinced you that just such a, such a very simple point of origin task can be a really powerful test bed for spatial cognition research. And we, then we can use this research, our understanding of what we really need to enable you to orient naturally in these environments and use this to improve our interfaces. And then, we, if we have improved interfaces, we can again use them to do better research. And ultimately, by bringing these two together, really have an improved setup and improved research methods and improved understanding of where we are, where we're going, and what we need to be able to do. So, all right. So, in concluding, I'd like to thank all the various funding agencies, and you can find more on my website at myspacelab.com. Thanks.